Last time on MB's review of Terror for Mars. There was enough really specific crap about evolution in this movie to remind me of Scottish scientist Douglas Dixon's flop sequel book Man After Man. Wait, his name isn't Douglas, it's Dougal? Like Dougal the dog in that old John Stewart movie? Okay, whatever, Dougal? Yeah, sure, Dougal Dixon. Hey everybody, so today I have something special and weird that I think I can uniquely contribute to YouTube. Because I know the truth. The truth about Afterman. Now, if you guys are new to the channel, my name is Mio Buster Green. I'm a 1990s cartoon action hero, and I normally do reviews of cartoons, movies, and anime. Please subscribe. I need it. Last week, while I was attempting to review Takashi Miike's Terra from Mars, the mind-boggling live-action anime, it was so mind-bogglingly weird that it reminded me just way too much of Dougal Dixon's flop speculative biology book, Man After Man, with its basic concepts of post-human evolution, conversion evolution of animals to the dead end of two-legged sentience, and in researching it, I found out that, holy shit, Dougal Dixon is huge in Japan. I mean, like, Eric Crafton huge. And therefore, the invisible connections in my head were probably all real and definitely seemed to directly influence at least a couple of major anime, including at the very least, Terra for Mars and Gargantua on the Burden Planet, which has a whole twist ending that I don't want to get into right now. So then I went into a massive deep dive iceberg about Dougal Dixon's original breakup book, Afterman, a speculative deep dive on the future of animals 50 million years in the future to opposite itself from the extinction of the dinosaurs. And yeah, as it turns out, for the country that created Pokemon and Digimon, Afterman somehow fits right in there like a glove. So while deep diving into this iceberg, I discovered two things of extreme interest to me. First of all, are Japanese television adaptations of the book Afterman, and secondly, the fact that it's now lost media. So I'm going to attempt to clarify this because there are hundreds of YouTube videos about how this is a long lost lost media gem and the actual truth of that is it's not lost media it's just a bunch of people think that it is or maybe it's more of like a story about how it was lost and over time the scandal of it being hidden away has like overtaken the truth but it's been unhidden for like at least the past seven years and no one really cared after the fact to report that it had been found well, fuck that, because today, I found it. Or at least I tried to find it, unlike a bunch of other losers who are gonna, like, tell you the legend of how it was lost rather than the truth. Because anyone who tries to obfuscate the truth is my enemy. But yeah, you guys are in for a real treat. I have found both the Afterman anime and the Afterman documentary in Japan, and I'm going to review them today for you guys. Now, it's common knowledge that Dougal Dixon's first breakout book, Afterman, has a really big shadow in Japan. I mean, I saw a lot of cryptobiology YouTubers and they couldn't really do the groundwork because they don't speak Japanese, but I do. You see, I spent three hellish years trekking across Japan, trying to find myself, find my soul, and all I got in the end was deadly radiation, some dangerous women, and some nematodes. But at least now I can Google in Japanese like a five-year-old and check the work. That being said, my Japanese isn't always the best, so if I made any mistakes, by all means, feel free to leave a comment and check me. Now, let me explain why this all matters. Afterman was Dougal Dixon's breakout hit book, inspired by the numerous questions he had as a kid about the ending to H.G. Wells' The Time Machine movie. See, that movie ends with human beings evolving into the hideous Morlock monsters, and as a child, Dixon saw this movie and it fucking traumatized him. It's like the way some people get really traumatized by like seeing like Pinocchio or Beauty and the Beast or Disney's Robin Hood, you know, all those traumatic childhood movies. Well, anyway, Dougal became obsessed and terrified by the Morlocks, the hideous post-humanoid evolved human monsters that are the end final boss of H.G. Wells' The Time Machine movie. He straight up thought that this movie was the definitive dark rail fate of the human race. And he would stay awake at night having vivid nightmares about transforming into a hideous Morlock himself. 
And as time went on, his obsession only grew. He needed to prove whether or not human beings would actually become the Morlocks because only he could stop it. And so he realized that the only way he could stop the rise of the Morlocks would be to scientifically prove that they would or would not happen. And then after he did that, he could make a plan of how to stop them. And so this crazy little boy became super obsessed with the concept of evolution. Now, I think over time, he eventually actually proved the Morlocks as being scientifically possible. And that led to his further nightmare inducing book, Man After Man, and his further descent into fear and madness. But for today, let's just talk about After Man because that's the coolest book he ever wrote. After Man, meanwhile, sprung up after a few years later, he had a very negative tone conversation with his elderly father on the topic of saving the whales, to which his very Scottish father replied roughly, Save the whales? Ah, fuck them. Fuck those whales. If they're gonna die out, so be it. That's what God wanted. They had their chance, and we won't get any new animals until the old ones die out. And that sent Dougal into a state of enlightenment, where he spent the next several years really dwelling on his father's delirious whale-hating rant and trying to predict what those new animals are going to be when we as a collective humanity eat the last delicious whale and then after that the last tiger chokes to death on Chick-fil-A wrappers and so on and so forth, killing off all the animals that currently exist. Now, this book drops these insane Pokemon-like evolutions for existing everyday animals that were thought to be really cool by really anyone who read this book but they had a massive second life recently on the internet because people are sharing the book. But that's all recent. Back in the day when these books first came out in the 80s, you know who fully embraced them with open arms? Japan. Japan was just way too super into it. So sometime after that, America apparently got the rights to make a movie of Afterman, but it failed. The rights jumped around a few studios. It's currently tied up right now with Paramount Studios who, I mean, it's paramount. They're never going to do anything with them unless, you know, suddenly they all show up on like the next season of Star Trek somehow. A documentary called The Future is Wild was made in 2005. As an attempt to roll around the idea while sidestepping the aforementioned paramount rights freeze, Future is Wild cleverly avoids the 500 million year time slot that was featured in Afterman and contains none of the animals in Afterman but does contain one or two distant relatives of them. Luckily though, the Paramount rights freeze somehow didn't apply to Japan. So on Japan's version of PBS, the NHK, which you might remember from the anime Welcome to the NHK, they got super invested in Afterman. And so according to internet legends, they created an anime and a stop motion documentary based on it around, let's say 1991-ish. However, the legend of them being lost media is really just a legend and mostly a big misunderstanding. So let's start off by talking about the anime. Let's watch the anime now.
Ding, 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 ding. Well, that's it. Did you enjoy the Afterman anime? I'm not joking, that's the whole thing. The song was catchy, and I liked that they homaged uh, Dougal Dixon's haunting obsession with the time machine in it. A lot of people think what we just watched is the opening to a long-lost Afterman anime series, but I can prove that that's not the case, because check this out. Here is the supposed long-lost opening to the Mega Man slash Rockman anime series. No, I'm lying to you. This is just the original Japanese commercial for Mega Man 1 on the original Famicom NES. Because in the 80s, to explain complicated, fantastic things like NES games and books to a television audience in Japan, sometimes anime would be created. Because you can use anime for commercials too, it doesn't have to just be movies and TV shows, and Japanese people like making and watching anime. So what I'm trying to tell you guys is the Afterman anime is just a commercial. There is no actual anime series. It's just this cute little commercial with this cute little song, and I think it was probably promoting a kid's edition of the book. Oh, and I just discovered this today, which you might think is cool. This is actually the most brand new recent commercial for this book from 1981 created by the Kyoto Bookstore in October of 2021. Which leads me to another massive discovery I made during this deep dive. Very sadly, in the West, Afterman has only been reprinted twice. Its original 1981 run, and an updated more recent reprint after it started slowly trending online recently. And Dougal Dixon's other books? Forget it. Not only have they not been reprinted since the 80s, but now they're going for like thousands of dollars online because he's so popular online, you know? But in Japan, the book has honestly never gone out of print to the point where when I looked for it, I identified at least four major revisions slash reprints, including the aforementioned kids edition that I guess this anime is a commercial for. Oh, but it didn't even stop there. There are also model kits of the animals. And when I'm looking into the model kits, I'm kind of getting the implication that they're from a museum exhibit where you can see statues of the Afterman animals and maybe these model kits are just literally scaled down versions of the same statues or maybe they're not. I can't find all that much about this exhibit, just vague confirmation it did happen and it might have possibly toured outside of Japan, possibly even in the US, but this is very hard to confirm because it all happened in the 80s and there's very limited info about it left. Okay, actual major fact revision now here. Um, so I thought this exhibit hadn't run since the 80s, but I'm finding new pictures of it. And it's looking like they're actually rerunning the exhibit right now this year in Kyoto at the Kyoto Science Museum. Anyway, so Afterman just continued rolling along in Japan, getting bigger and bigger. It got so big, it got a set of stamps at the post office, but you know you made it when you're on a stamp. And I again need to point out that Afterman was embraced at such an incredibly mainstream level in Japan. Like, it was up there, like, it was as big as Harry Potter. Like, the after person, if you brought up Afterman, they know exactly what you were talking about. And another reason they might know exactly what you were talking about was because of the Afterman documentary that also aired around 1991, which gave pretty much everyone in Japan a nice overview of the book and kind of all the best parts of it. So yeah, it's not all bad news. The anime might have just been a commercial, but this documentary does exist and it is over an hour long. Now, as far as I can tell what happened with the documentary is, everyone on YouTube thought it was lost media and I think for a while it was, but it has been uploaded and sitting on a low view channel since 2015. So prior to this, a lot of people had only seen clips of it, but I have discovered the whole thing. It's just on YouTube. I just search for it. I don't think I did anything special. Although I can technically speak Japanese, and because of that I could do a full sub or dub translation of this movie, but I'm honestly too lazy and too busy trying to make my own anime right now, and I quite frankly just don't want to do it. I'm not sure if anyone would actually care enough, tell me otherwise if you care enough, and I really don't think it's worth it because I don't know if this thing is a full-on media orphan or if the NHK would try to like sue me to get it back later. So I kind of just don't want to touch it, you know? But I will link you to the full doc, and if you want to sub it yourself, 
by all means, go ahead. If you want to dub it, I'd be happy to volunteer my services to dub over Dr. Nixon or the NHK host if you want to do it. By the way, hilariously in the Japanese dub, Dr. Dixon is dubbed by original Lupin III voice actor Yasuo Yamada, who's just straight up using his usual cool ass Lupin voice. And my final take on the movie is, as cool as the movie is, it's honestly not that cool. It's an old NHK style documentary. And like most NHK docs, it has this super, super chill ambience that a lot of chill Japanese media has but it's so chill that it almost demands I fall asleep watching it. I literally had to struggle not to fall asleep on this documentary the first time I watched it, and I literally just drank in a full cup of coffee the second I turned it on. So today, for the rest of this video, I'm just gonna do a quick breakdown, listing everything in the documentary, how great I thought it was, and I think half the reason this movie got classified as lost media was because the documentary is so fucking boring that people were just uploading the not boring parts of it with the boring parts omitted. Because as someone who can understand Japanese, I can tell you this documentary is actually pretty goddamn boring. It halfway summarizes the book Afterman, but then it drops into some normal nature documentary bullshit to just pad out its runtime. You know, to be more educational instead of just pure biological fanfiction and splendor. And with that all out of the way, let's go to today's feature film. 1991's Japanese documentary, Afterman. So, we start off with a T-Rex, and the narrative says that 65 billion years ago, dinosaurs ruled the planet, but now they're all dead. So if the pattern repeats, that means that we're all going to be dead in 50 billion years in the future. Dr. Dixon shows up and introduces the main topics of the book with his Lupin the Third Voice, while also introducing the basic ideas of the documentary. And then we flip over to these two clown TV hosts who are like... Everybody sure loves animals, right? Well, in the future, there will be new ones because of evolution. Then we pan over to the super cool 3D map of the Afterman Earth. And the TV hosts are kind of pissed and awkwardly amused that Japan does not exist in the future, having collided with Korea and become a chain of mountains. Then the hosts are all like, let's time travel! And we start off with a pretty cool and weird twist that the stop motion animations in this film were done by an American company called Dynamation International Corporation. They have a really shadowy history. They're apparently only specialized in making robot dinosaurs. And I guess in this case, the Afterman puppets. They were apparently really successful throughout the 80s and 90s. But then the company just mysteriously completely dissolved in 2001 overnight, leading to various museums not paying them and just keeping the robot dinosaurs as long as they still worked. So we start off the film with the Desert Leaper. It looks like an evolved kangaroo, but it's actually a super evolved giant desert field mouse. And it features some specialized fat deposits like the kind that a camel utilizes, creating a pretty weird looking creature since it just goes for long periods of time without eating. It apparently spends most of its life just surveying the desert, looking for oasis and other bodies of water to keep it alive. And then it drinks heavily like a camel does. Oh, and very interestingly, the doc points out that when it's fully hydrated, it plumps up, which is something I didn't get from the book. Then once it's eaten and drinking its full, it departs on another long trip. After that, we visit a small island, which is relatively Hawaii on the map. And here we get a focus on the Fluor, one of the goofiest and most Pokemon-like creatures in Afterman. Despite being an animal, it resembles and smells like a flower, and it's kind of the opposite of a Venus flytrap. Instead of being an animal-like carnivorous plant, it's a plant-like carnivorous animal. The doc really demonstrates that they've trained themselves to really take out the plants and go for long periods of time without moving to trick insects. The fluor is a weird evolved bat, by the way. We also get this great hand puppet animation of it just eating some bugs. And then the doc switches at a really disoriented breakneck pace to the ocean where we focus on the surf bat. The surf bat seems like it might be a new addition for this doc, or if it was an afterman, it was only described and not seen. Either way, uh, I never saw a picture of it before, but it seems to be an evolved member of the sea lion otter family that has taken on the qualities of bats, manta rays, and manatees. It has a pretty haunting angelic silhouette as it flies through the water. And then after that, we go to the Night Stalker, which is seemingly Japan's favorite afterman because of just the abundant weirdness of its weird foot hands, which just seem absolutely absurd. The Night Stalker is an evolved terrestrial bat that has given up on flight in exchange for power, 
but it still has all the bat's echolocation powers, and we see it use them to make a pretty dramatic moonlight kill. Then Lupin III, Dougal Dixon, comes out to give some even more info about the Night Stalker. He mentions that, aren't you surprised that this evolved from the bats? And then the doc goes into our really boring modern info sections, where they just talk about bats for people who don't know what bats are for like 10 minutes. This is a pretty minor tangent. And then we go to another section where they slightly focus on penguins, but not enough. And then they also point out that the floor has many traits in common with the orchid mantis. And you see a very brutal video of an orchid mantis tricking a butterfly and then eating its face. After that, the dock goes on to the Galapagos Islands where Dougal Dixon rides in a boat to a mangrove swamp. And they focus on a rear group of freshwater manta rays. And then they go back on land to see the Galapagos tortoise. And everyone's like, oh, it's so kawaii because it's so big and so old. Then they switch to a cactus field where the Komodo dragon lives. And the narrator is impressed that the dragon eat the cactus, even though the cactus is covered in needles. So they point out that in the isolation of the Galapagos Islands, a bunch of weird animals sprang up. And they focus on the Galapagos sea iguana because it's an iguana, which normally lives in the desert, but because it was stuck on this island, it learned how to swim. And because it was stuck on an island, it evolved a swimming tail, and now it eats mussels. Then we flip over to a volcano, and the narrator points out that even the cactuses evolved to grow on this volcano, and that's pretty weird too. Dougal Dixon shows up and chills with a bunch of sea iguanas, and then they explain the whole theory of evolution, and how Charles Darwin figured it out by seeing a Darby finch, a black finch, and a cactus finch all on the Galapagos Islands, and figured out that there's three different finches evolved in three different ways to deal with the different problems on the island. Dixon then talks more about evolution and Earth's future while hanging out with the tortoise. Then we go to Iceland, another island with even more volcanoes. And then you get a lengthy geology lesson about how volcanoes work, how magma causes continental drift, and then you see the Pangaea collapse, which plays out at a very slow and frustrating rate. And then we go to a museum where we see a bunch of animals from the Mesozoic period, and we talk about how horses evolved from having paws to having hooves over thousands of years. And then we cut to some modern horses who are benefiting from that. Dixon flies over them in his helicopter, flying over the Arizona desert. And then we go to Africa, where he jumps into his maximum power safari zeep to catch up to a stampeding horde of aurochs. And then we have the Africa sequence. The Africa sequence is the second longest, second most boring, most off-topic section in the entire doc. We just get a long grocery list of African animals, like the zebra, the antelope, the lion. Dougal Dixon steps out in Africa and plays with a dead oryx skull that a lion ate. He jiggles it around and points out it was old because it had worn out teeth. The African animal section is so boring. It just, it really pads out the documentary and it just drags forever, just being an average boring nature documentary. I swear to God, they just put this in here to cover for time. A big rainstorm starts and then they focus on some animals herding across Africa, grazing in grass. We look at the zebras again, the oryxes again, we look at some gazelles, and the cheetah comes out and he hunts the gazelle, and then he's like, oh wow, it's so fast. And then it catches and eats the gazelle. Then we see a cheetah eating the gazelle with very graphic detail. And when it's done, a hyena and a jackal and a vulture all come up to clean it up. And the three of them are actually surprisingly cool around each other. Again, this has nothing to do with Afterman. It's just animals eating other animals. And then the hyena runs away with the corpse. And then there's a super random scene of a dung beetle. It's extremely disturbing. It's just like, hey, remember dung beetles exist? So anyway, Dr. Dixon shows up again. And it's just like, wow, there sure are a lot of animals in Africa. And then finally, we get back to Afterman content. So first they show the final destruction of Japan as it collides into Russia and South Korea, leaving behind a kind of interesting wake. And then we watch the destruction of Australia and the South Pacific Islands as they crash together. And finally, Africa squishes into Europe and part of it breaks off into a cool island. And with all that preamble out of the way, we can finally go back to talking about Afterman. So now we join Dougal Dixon in a very fake claymation version of Africa when they were literally just in the real Africa. Anyway, he says it looks different now because it's future Africa 
and we introduced the Rabbuk, one of the more popular creatures in Afterman because it's a fun giant rabbit. Then we go to the Gigantilope, a giant futuristic antelope that has traded its speed for power. And Dougal Dixon gives the most sarcastic, sad look he can muster up. Now, despite being a rhino-sized antelope, it still uses its horns to for food. And then we introduce the Oboon, a pretty insane evolution of the baboon that's stronger and faster than modern lions and cheetahs. The Oboon tries to take down the Gigantilope, and there's a lot of blood, and eventually it takes it down. Then we get another bad puppet scene as they feast, but then the much larger and much more vicious Raboon comes out to, to steal their kill. And okay, I now understand that the live action Africa scenes were supposed to mirror these scenes and juxtapose them. Anyway, the Gigantilope is reduced to a pile of bones and then this new animal comes out called a goal. It's kind of like a rodent vulture. It comes out and it eats the bones of the Gigantilope and apparently the goal is like the hyena of the future. And then we go back to the incredibly boring Japanese hosts who are just having a good time watching this show learning about animals and evolution. They're just these sad talking heads with nothing of value to add. They're just like, wow, I didn't know that. Did you? Those animals sure are cute. So after bullshitting for like another five minutes, the male host, who could not look any more like a Japanese man from 1991, whips out his fun after man convergent evolution chart, where he points out which animals are doing the same job as modern animals. For anyone who doesn't get it because they're just really dumb. This isn't even my native language and I understood this. <laughs> like, to not understand this, you would have to be like a child or just straight up not paying attention to like literally this entire movie up to this point. So we finally go back to Dr. Dixon who gives more and more trivia about the animals we just saw. He gives us behind the scenes explanation of why he thinks the baboon would evolve into the much larger and much more vicious rabbit. The super futuristic baboon with the power of a tiger and it has a giant tail which makes it almost a convergent evolution of the Tyrannosaurus Rex. Then we go into a talk about convergent evolution. We see that the shark, the dolphin, and the ichthyosaurus, which is now dead, rest in peace, all pretty much work the same way. And then we just watch dolphins do cute things. And then there's another commercial break. So after the commercial break, we're back in the dinosaur age. We see a couple of different dinosaurs. I think this is a Gallimimus, and that's a Velociraptor. The raptors hunt it down and catch and kill it. And then we flip over to an iguanodon. And the point here is that carnivore dinosaurs are different from herbivore dinosaurs. But then the asteroid comes down and kills them all. Poor little guys never had a chance. The narrator points out that the exploding asteroid would have made the dinosaurs very angry because it blocked out the sun and made them starve to death. And yeah, quite frankly, nothing makes me angry like starving to death. And so that's how all the dinosaurs died. But you know who didn't die? This fucking possum. So apparently this possum here is the father of all mammals. All the deer, all the whales, all the people came from this single possum. By the way, I don't think it was actually a possum, but it was a similar rodent. Anyway, the doc is just saying it's this possum here. Then the doc gets hella boring again. We focus on some random monkeys for a while. Then we go back to Africa. We look at the zebra, the oryx, and the antelope again and focus on a lion that's trying to kill them. And then we focus on the first ape to walk on two legs and become a human. And the narrator explains that apes went from the forest to the city. They invented agriculture and farming and became masters of the world. Then we go to the English countryside where a sheep herder lives with a very bad co-worker. We see some dudes shearing a sheep and they explain that sheep have become so symbiotically connected with humans that the sheep will all just die if humans aren't there to cut their fur off. And while all this is going on, Dr. Dixon is enjoying a fantastic, all expense paid vacation in the Galapagos Islands, and he's going scuba diving. He runs into a sea lion and takes some selfies with it, and has a good, happy little time with the friendly little guys. Then we go into outer space and look at spacemen, and the documentary calls the spacemen the most powerful, evolved humans to ever exist in history. The documentary then calls out that the human race, despite being the greatest harnesses of the power of the sun has created the evils of industry, air pollution, and climate change. A proven fact in 1991 before it was inconvenient to certain people. And this will lead to animals dying. We then fly over to New York City and get a nice pan back to Scotland where Google Dixon lives. 
and now he's chilling in some very disturbing Scottish ruins. They really focus on this creepy statue of like a head with worms in it. He gives this really sad speech about how all the people who built and lived in this castle have died, and someday you're gonna be dead too. And all the animals that are living on the planet right now, they're gonna be dead too. So think about that. Then we see a massive explosion and pivot back to the boring hosts. The hosts talk about, gee, how morbid Dougal Dixon is. We have to be careful not to destroy ourselves so we can move into space and conquer the universe someday. And so the documentary goes to a Gundam style space colony where they straight up recreate the opening shots of Gundam. I know this because I watch a lot of Gundam. And the tone is almost like, hey, Dougal Dixon said you're gonna die, so you better get to work on that space colony if you don't wanna die. So Dougal Dixon shows up inside the space colony and he looks out the window and he just seems a bit morbid that human beings would create a space colony and live so far away from the earth where they started. But then we get another commercial break and then we go back to Afterman again. So in the next sequence of Afterman, we get some rabbits grazing on a plane and we juxtapose them with current rabbits to be like, this is a bigger rabbit. Then the phalanx, the giant wolf-sized rat shows up to prey on them and the narrator points out that in the future, rabbits and rats have become the new cats and dogs of the world and they hate each other. Uh, I think that's kind of a bad kind of comparison since dogs don't exactly eat cats. Anyway, then we get another claymation sequence where the phalanx hunts the Rabux, but in an interesting twist, the Rabux have retained their rabbit ancestor's super jumping ability, so they're able to escape the battle just fine. So, then we go into another sequence where Dr. Dixon is in a jungle in North China, and he reveals another afterman called the Tree Drummer. This is a cat-like elephant creature that climbs trees and has a tiny little trunk and everything. Then the next Afterman is the Chirrut, one of the first animals in the book Afterman. It's basically a super long, super flexible squirrel evolution. Dr. Dixon again comes out with his bad acting and scares it away and good god, he's overacting in all these skits. They explain that the tree drummer is filling the niche the woodpecker used to have and then they focus on a digging fox and explain that it digs ants to eat. And then we switch over to the much cuter fennec fox because everyone likes looking at that one. Then a helicopter flies out with Dr. Dixon and arrives in the jungles of Central America. And this is the worst, most boring, most off topic section in the entire documentary. They just completely overload you with random stock footage establishing shots of the jungle. And every time you think it's about to go somewhere, they change topics at a completely disorienting pace. They show some rain, they show some birds, they show a poison dart frog, they show a bunch of different bugs, they go over a boar, they go, is its name also the peccary, they go to a red panda, they go to a forest rat, they go to a puma, they go to some monkeys, they go to some flowers, back to the monkeys. They almost focus on the monkeys, but no way, now they're focusing on parrots. They talk about sloths, one of the sloths falls off a tree. Oh wow, sloths are stupid and they focus on it just long enough to laugh at it as it falls out of another tree. And then there's a commercial break. So that whole like freaking half hour section was just like a complete waste of time. And then they end it with, hey, by the way, people in South America are lighting the forest on fire. I guess this is a call out to the fact that Brazilians are burning down the rainforest back in 1991 and still to this day. Then we flip over to Africa again, and in the Afterman time period, it is now a luscious jungle like the one in Central America. And here we have a sloth-like animal, but it has a super armored tail, and I think its name is the Clatter or the Ladder. Long story short, it's a super evolved monkey cat, and ironically enough, its only predator is also a super evolved monkey cat. Its main predator is the Striger, it's one of the cooler Afterman animals. It's a super evolved tiger that has evolved opposable thumbs and the dexterity of a monkey. And it's pretty terrifying, actually. Anyway, the clatter has a super armored tail, so if it can just avoid the striker with some perfect positioning, the two of them have a stalemate and they can't eat each other. Then we go back to Dr. Dixon's house where he postures in front of a massive bookshelf and tells everyone to look at a picture of Charles Darwin. Then we see some cells dividing inside a pregnancy and suddenly we focus on a bunch of microorganisms that the documentary points out are the smallest animals. We see a fish egg and an octopus hatches out of it 
and the baby octopus is kind of cute. And the narrator says, the baby octopus has a big world to explore and it swims away never to be seen again. Then we see some red bellied sea cormorants who look pretty nutty. We also see a concord bird and then we contrast them with the blue footed booby because red or blue, they're both really goofy birds. We also see a bird laying a damn egg and making this really uncomfortable face as it does it. Then we go back to the damn antelopes in Africa again, still being pursued by cheetahs. And finally, a baby human is born and the narrator is like, human beings are the most civilized because we can protect even the smallest babies with our advanced technology. Then we go to the Afterman time period again, one last time to focus on umbrella squirrels, which are one of the more fantastical things in the book, also featured prominently in the anime. The dog points out that even though they can fly using their tails as parachutes, they also like to swim. Although the animation of them swimming is probably the worst animation in the whole doc. Then we focus on some spiders, which also parachute with webs as their transportation ability in modern times. And we see them fly away and that's the modern analog. Then we go back to the Rabux one more time and they straight up animated two Rabux making sweet, sweet love and making a baby. What the hell, Japan? Anyway, the baby is born and it's very cute and everyone loves it. Then Dr. Dixon comes out and mentions that, hey, even if everyone you know is going to be dead in the future, at least babies are still being born. And as long as babies are being born, something's alive and everyone likes babies, right? Then we get another commercial break and we go on a really random tangent on another city in Canada, which has a dinosaur museum. We focus on the Sternonicosaurus, which then a completely random different scientist comes out and mentions is going to evolve into Dinosapien if it wasn't conveniently killed by the asteroid. Also, hilariously, Dinosapien's Japanese name is Kyoru Ningen, which kind of just literally translates to the dinosaur person. Anyway, we go back to Dr. Dixon, who's walking around his house, and he runs into this really insane looking mutant turkey that stands on one leg. We mentioned that it stands on one leg because kiwis stand on one leg and we see a kiwi eating some leaves. Then we go back to the sea cormorants from a few minutes ago and we focus on this weird turkey monster man thing. Apparently, even though it has legs only and no arms, they think it's going to evolve to become super intelligent and build cities and Wi-Fi routers and a solar power plant. But unfortunately, it still has to lay eggs like a turkey and wow, uh, that's a thing, I guess. Anyway, Dr. Dixon finishes out saying that animals are going to continue to evolve no matter what we do. And then Turkey Monster Man starts moving away, tries to talk to him, but it kind of freaks him out, and it waves goodbye to the audience as it leaves. Dr. Dixon laughs it off as it walks away, and he's like, ah, that rascal, that turkey man. What a strange character. And that's essentially the end of the documentary. We go back to the talking heads one more time, and they're like, Wow, that sure was a weird documentary. Did you see all those animals? I can't believe human beings are going to be replaced by that. Then the talking heads remind us that Dr. Dixon said that the earth won't always belong to human beings and that when we're all dead, the animals are going to take it back. They ramble on for several minutes about nothing important. And then abysmally, we get to the fact that someday in the far distant future, the sun will become a red giant and eventually swallow up and kill the earth. Dougal Dixon appears one last time on the dead floor of the ocean, commenting that the red giant sun has evaporated all the water on Earth, killed every living creature, and that the history of evolution will end here. He has a real bittersweet tone, and he really embodies that. He's the only man who will see the Earth die, and he's the one who's going to close the door on Earth's history. Earth gets spanked by a solar flare and evaporates into dust instantly. And in the depths of space, a star twinkles, and the narrator points out that don't worry, even though the Earth has burned up to a crisp, somewhere in that nebula out there, the evolutions of human beings have escaped from their space colonies, and they're ready to continue the greatness of human history. And uh, that's the Afterman documentary. Kind of a bummer ending, but uh, eh, okay, it was, it was okay. All right, and that's almost everything out of the Afterman Japanese iceberg. But just to ruin your day as we wrap up things, I'm going to bring up again his other book, Man After Man, the book that is filled with hideous Cronenberg-like abominations, which were inspired by his deep-seated childhood fear of the Morlocks. Well, Japan read that book too, and although they didn't make any kind of anime or fun documentaries about that one, you know what they did end up making? Lifers. 
And I find this so ironic because of the strong amount of shit posts people make about just how unfuckable the Cronenbergs in this book are. But while you were all just laughing and being disgusted, Japan at least tried. And that's gotta count for something, right? This is the longest review video I've ever made. Usually they're only like 10 minutes long. Thank you immensely if you watched all 40 minutes of this. I doubt most people will. All right, I was Mewbuster Buster Green. I review Japanese media, and in this case, lost media. I like lost media, but there's not much of it that you can actually find, and this is kind of a happy accident because no one actually looked except me. All right, uh, anyway, please subscribe. I'll see you next time. I usually do videos about Gundam. Later.